All right, take it away. Caddy, Carmen. Thank you very much, and thank you for the amazing intro, Yanni. Uh, I'm really excited to be here in Finland uh, among so many fellow developers. And I'm actually especially excited about talking about good code. So this is something that I spend a lot of my time thinking about and something I'm trying to get better at. And I hope that a lot of you um, do as well. So um, I'm going to take you on a journey of discovery of good code. And I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, we will all come a little bit closer to glimpsing that elusive beast that is good code. So just to give you an idea of what the um, next 30 minutes is going to look like, um, I'm going to give you some food for thought on code goodness, on various aspects, how we do code, how we collaborate, and what the problems are with good code in JavaScript. And never fear, it's not going to be all wishy-washy. I'm actually going to give you two actionable things, so actionable suggestions that you could choose to adopt uh, tomorrow or today that hopefully could improve your code quality in your current project. So now you might, might be wondering, who is this person and why does she have so many opinions about code? So hi, uh, my name is Caddy. I'm currently the head of Mobile development at Formidable. We are a JavaScript consultancy. Build things in React and React Native and GraphQL. Check out formidable.com. And uh, just with a caveat that obviously I don't believe that years of experience um, equate to skill, but uh, just to give you an idea of my developer journey and the basis from which I've arrived at the opinions that I have now, I just wanted to give you a history of what I've done as a developer. So I've had a job writing code for the past nine years. So just out of, out of university, I got my first coding job and I've been continuously employed uh, for the past nine years. Um, I've never really had any more than um, two weeks between nine years ago and now where I haven't either written or read some code. And um, primarily this has been in JavaScript. I think one thing to note is that I didn't start with JavaScript. JavaScript wasn't the first language um, that I wrote code in. It was actually the fourth, I think, or fifth. So I've, I've, I've dabbled in other languages, but I've kind of stuck with JavaScript because despite its faults, I love it. Uh, another thing to note is that I've almost always worked at software consultancies. So there's a blip in the middle there where I went to a startup and had that experience, but then I've kind of gone back onto the consultancy train. And why that's um, relevant is that especially um, the consultancies that I've been fortunate enough to work with and for um, have really valued code quality and maintainability and the idea that we are not building code just to make things work, but we're also building code that's maintainable for whoever's going to be taking over after we leave. Because as a consultant, you have the idea that you go and you do something and then you leave, but then someone else is going to maintain it. So I think about code quality a lot. And lastly, for the past four years or so, I've been in a role where I've been a tech lead or a manager. And why that's relevant is that it's kind of been up to me to uh, set the rules and enforce code quality rules for my team. Now, one thing about the word good in general is that it's relative. So from a philosophical standpoint, it's relative, you know, good and bad. But good code itself is relative. I mean, people have written books about it. Um, we could be here for hours, but we won't be, don't worry. Um, so just to tone this down into something that can be delivered in a talk, we're going to narrow down the parameters. So when we talk about good code, we're going to be talking specifically about good JavaScript code. So this is both front-end and on Node.js. Secondly, we're going to be talking about code where you have two or more developers working on it. So the rules are a bit different if you're working on something on your own. The, like, whether it's good or not, it's, it's subjective to you. So specifically, the interaction of at least two people is important here. And lastly, we're going to be talking about a living code base. 
Now, what I mean by this is it's a code base that's actively moving, so features are being added, new people are being onboarded, the code is actively being worked on, improved, changed. Now, this is the question that actually prompted this whole talk. So I've done quite a few interviews for developers, and one question that I love asking is, what does good code mean to you? And the reason I love asking this is, um, it's really indicative to where the person is in their software, software developer journey, and also what problems they're currently experiencing on their current code base. Now, I don't think I'm brave enough to do an audience participation bit, but just have a think of what you would say. And I'm gonna show you some answers that I usually get. So people would usually say that good code needs to be readable and tested or testable and easy to understand, well-documented, reusable and consistent. And interestingly, something that I don't usually get as the first answer is that it does what it's meant to do and it's performant. It's almost like those things are implied, but when we think about good code and bad code, we don't really think about the code that we write, we think about the code that we read, because obviously we think that our own code is amazing. And I found, I mean, this is a chart based on no facts, just my opinion, but I have found that how much you care about code quality is definitely related to how much time you've spent working on old code. I don't just mean other people's code, I also mean your own code from two years ago. Because, I mean, I think a lot of us have experienced this thing where we go to a code base, we see a weird function, we think, who wrote that? And we, you know, do a little git blame just to see, and it was you. How do we write code? You've probably seen a variation of this loop. I mean, I've heard of this since I started coding. Um, that the way you write code, you obviously get some requirements. Number one, you make it work. Um, you take the requirements, you just make it do the thing that's on paper. Then number two, you make it clean. So you will pull all the magic numbers out the constants. You will remove all your console logs. You will um, like just tidy things up, break it into little functions, just make it um, good for whatever standard you currently have. Number three, optimize. So at this point, you're going to look at uh, network requests. Am I doing a bunch of network requests that could be combined into one? Am I doing a bunch of uh, file system reads that could, could be combined? Am I doing a bunch of loops over the same array? So this is optimization for both uh, memory and for clean code and for like network um, optimization. And number four is generalized. So at this point you will think, okay, is there anything reusable here that maybe I can pull into a util and maybe I'll test it separately or maybe I'll pull something into a type, right? And then these are the four loops that you go to. Now, the truth that we all kind of know uh, and the reason why there are so many variations of this is that the only point that really matters to most people is the first one. So make it work. So this is kind of all that most people care about. This is all that your client cares about, your stakeholder, the users. The users don't care if your code is tidy or not. They just want it to do the thing. And um, the rest is something that we can choose to do. We don't have to do. <clears throat> we can choose to do it if we care about the person who will be maintaining, maintaining, to go, maintaining your code going forward. And one thing to note is that that person might be you. So the way that I think about it is that the first point is for the client and then the rest of the, the rest of the points, two, and two three and four, um, are for the future caddy. So conversely, what is bad code? And um, what you might have noticed that, that what we consider to be bad code is not code that's not performant, because that doesn't really come up that often. And it's not even code that doesn't work, because that would be broken code. We consider bad code to be code that we don't understand, and code that's difficult to maintain. So it will be, it will be code from us two years ago, or code from a developer that's just left, or code from a code base that you've just inherited. We will look at it, we don't understand it, and we think it's bad code. 
Now, I love this comic. Um, I spent a good hour trying to find it, so please enjoy it. I think this is very indicative of what it feels like to go into a new code base that you know, has a history. Uh, you'll be in a jungle, you're looking around, you don't know what anything is. There is a random structure that leads to nowhere. There are code comments that aren't helpful. There is like a very efficient road from A to B. And there are contraptions that you just don't understand the purpose of. But one thing to note is that no one writes bad code on purpose. I mean, I hope you don't. Like, chances are, unless you are chaotic evil, you're not going to wake up in the morning and think, you know what, today I'm going to really mess with the person who's going to maintain this. There was probably a reason for how it is. There was probably a reason for this weird workaround. But you just don't know what it is because that person maybe doesn't work on the code base anymore. Or just you don't remember. So the key takeaway here is that we need to communicate the history of the weird decisions in our code base. Speaking of keys, um, one thing that I actually do get a lot when I ask people about what they think good code is, is that they want it to be consistent. I think a lot of you will have the same opinion. So whether it's you know double quotes or single quotes or constant functions or function functions or default exports or uh, named exports, you don't really care as long as it's the same across the code base. You know you could adapt, but it's going to be annoying where where when one file has a constant function, one is a function function, then you've got a React class somewhere, and it's going to frustrate you. So you would rather have a consistent thing that's maybe not your preference than your preference, but only 50% of the time. The problem with consistency in JavaScript is that there aren't consistent best practices. Best practices are subjective to you, your experience, uh, maybe what you've done in the past. What I think is good code right now for me is probably not what you think is good code for, right now for you. Also, even if you decide that you're going to take the most popular code trend and go with that, code trends also change over time. So even if you look at React classes versus React hooks, or if you remember that phase with render props, um, you know, things get popular and then they go out of style. So even if you manage to boil down what's cool, what's in right now in JavaScript, what's considered good practices, and write your code like that in two years' time, that will be out of date because the practices have changed, and therefore your code is now bad. The other reason why it's really hard to have consistency in JavaScript is we have almost no rules. So JavaScript as a language is kind of a free-for-all. And lots of options is good, but too many op options makes it difficult to form decisions. That's why, as a JavaScript community, we are making rules for ourselves to help us make decisions. So this is why we have ESLint. This is why we have Prettier. This is why we have TypeScript. This is we ha why we have all of these front-end frameworks, which basically make some code decisions for us, and then we can follow the best practices from them. So one thing that I, I talk about Elm a lot, actually, because uh, I find it fascinating. So if you've not heard of Elm, it's a, a front-end language. You can write websites in it. It compiles down to JavaScript, but it's nothing like JavaScript. And it is incredibly opinionated. There are very strict rules for code flows. So uh, Elm uses a, it's like a, it's, some, it's a form that's similar to MVC, so it's called model view action update, pardon me, uh, a model view action update loop um, where you have a model which describes your data, you have a view that displays the data, then the view can trigger actions which will be you know, a button press and then you have an update function that updates the model which then updates the view and then goes in a loop. And you're probably all familiar with this because this is the architecture that Redux was inspired by, so it's exactly the same. But the whole language is, is built on top of it. It also comes with its own linter, so even though this might look odd to you, every single Elm project will look like this because the linter will enforce it. 
And also there's generally only one correct way to do things. So what they do in Elm is um, they promise no runtime exceptions because the Elm compiler forces you to address all the edge cases. Um, Now, the good thing about this is that this makes good practices universal. So chances are, if you are an Elm programmer, you've written an Elm project, you're proficient in it, and then you pick up another Elm program, you kind of already know what it's going to look like, the code indentation that's going to be the same, and also you know what the control flow is, because there's only one way to really do things. But the reason it hasn't picked up as much as it could have based on all these amazing promises is that it has a huge learning curve, especially for JavaScript developers, because we're used to being able to be absolute cowboys. Now, on a slightly less extreme side uh, is an example from Python. So I've I always liked Python as a programming language. Um, and Python actually does have some enforced um, annotation that's from the, um, from the language. So for example, Python doesn't have any braces. So the, um, for example, if you have an if statement, you would use spaces to show um, what's inside the if statement, which makes like the code flow a little bit readable. Uh, but actually what I really enjoy from Python is the, uh, the Zen of Python. So this is a very well-known Easter egg in Python. So if you open a Python REPL, on your computer and you type in import this, then you'll get this little poem printed out, which is called the Zen of Python. And it was put in by um, an American programmer um, who was working on Python, who was a core contributor. And this poem is basically about the philosophy around the Python programming language, how it was built. And it's like specific, but also not. So this, it's got some things here that are applicable to all languages. So, you know, explicit is better than implicit. Readability counts. Errors shouldn't pass silently unless explicitly silenced. So I really like this and I, I've, I've always wished we would have something like this in JavaScript. Unfortunately, that's not going to be possible because of all the options we have. Um, because there are different communities of JavaScript and we would never agree there is no central governing body um, that could set the Zen of JavaScript and get everyone to follow it. Um, our good code is very personal to us, personal to our project instead. But thankfully, you have the absolute power to do the Zen of your code base. Um, because you are in control of what is good and what is bad in your code base, you can define what good code is in your code base. You can define the rules, you can agree on the rules, and the, what is good code for the code base is shipped with the code base. So the definition of good is part of your code base. All right, that's enough on the history. Now for the tips. Now, I'm, going, I'm basically boiling this down to two suggestions. And uh, again, you know, it's completely optional. As in JavaScript, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but these hope are aiming to address the two biggest problems, I think, that we have with good code, which are consistency and history. So this, I, I put it down as a lead dev suggestion um, because it's kind of up to the lead dev on a project to enforce this. And this comes from the Zen of Python. So it's to document and enforce style decisions in your code base. So you can think of it as the Zen of your code base. So something that um, I, I like doing when I start a new Greenfield project, because uh, a lot of the time it will be with people I've never worked with. They have uh, different levels of experience. They've um, got different views of what good code is. Maybe they've heard something that I will like, but I haven't heard of yet. And um, what I like to do is we get together with the whole dev team for an hour, maybe even two hours. And then we just talk about how we would like to do this project. I mean, technically me as a lead developer, I could just say, I set the rules, this is good code, we're doing this. But I found that it's much better if the whole team has the ownership of 
like what we agree to be good code, what we agree to be um, the style decisions for this particular code base in this particular point in time. So we would have this talk, we will talk about, you know, we will talk about whether we use um, TypeScript or not, um, whether we use double quotes or single quotes, um, whether we use React classes or function components, and we document them. We add a section to the README uh, for code style decisions. Um, we make sure everyone's included, everyone's on board, everyone agrees to follow them. Then it's up to, up to the lead to set up linting or whatever code checks on CI to enforce what can be enforced, and also continuously improve the rules and refer back to them at code reviews. And one important part of this is also to walk through new joiners um, when they join the project. So I found that a lot of projects, you just have a big confluence page with all the, this is, this is all the links to all the repos, go for it. But I found that maybe half an hour or an hour of my time, one-on-one, -on -one, where I talk through what the philosophy is in our code base, show them the, um, the folder structure, um, anything odd in that particular code base, will give so much to that developer that they couldn't read just from the confluence page. And you can keep it simple, so it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Uh, so this is an example of just a section of the README with some code style decisions. This is not very complex, it's basically saying, you know, we're using index.js files. We don't use index.js files, sorry. We keep everything named, we use named exports, we, um, you know, use React functions, uh, things like that. So it's something that just on our initial call, that's what the team thought was Valu valuable to agree on, and we wrote it down, and we agreed to follow it. And if someone comes on board, they have a suggestion, we talk about it, and we can change things as, um, as code styles change, as people's opinions change. But it's written down, and everyone's on board. Now, if there's one thing, in my opinion, that you can do to make your code more maintainable, just one thing, it would be this, and it is to always explain in a code comment unusual decisions in your code. Now, this may be obvious, but sometimes it's worth reiterating things that may seem obvious. And what I mean by unusual decisions is the decisions that maybe frustrated you or annoyed you or you wish you didn't have to make. So, for example, uh, unusual API responses. I worked on a project once where the API didn't return a null or an undefined for an empty value. It returned a string with a space in it. And that is unusual, so I added a comment for that to explain why we had to have front-end code to handle this. Or due to a browser quirks, I think all of us have had to add some special CSS to make things work in Safari or Chrome or Opera. And it's just with that particular browser bug that you spend two days working on and you've got some weird CSS there and the next developer is going to come and go, why? <laughs> but if you have a code comment there, it will save them a whole lot of time and they don't think that it's a road to nowhere. And also due to complex and unusual business logic. So sometimes the client or whoever you report to just wants something that's weird. There's no way to do it cleanly with the API and they're the ones paying the bills, and sometimes you just have to. At this point, I would just write a comment, I would even link to the Jira ticket, going like, sorry, this is weird, but this is why. And just to show you a couple of examples from my team's code base. So this is an example of a filter. So it's a particular price filter. So the filter has a range in it. So if I was designing an API, I would have an object with like a min and a max. Um, but that's not what this API does, unfortunately. It um, returns the min and max values as a string where you have min dot dot max. So in order to extract these values, in order to actually do the filters and display the filters, uh, we need to use a regex. And here's a con code comment to ex explain why. And here's another example. So this is due to a third party library. So there was like a weird side effect. If you close the li library inside the modal, it calls the onClose method twice. But we do some async stuff in the onClose method. So we want it to be called just once. So we added a little fallback, added a comment. And I mean, I work in React Native. So this is an example of, 
oh, something doesn't work properly on Android, so we had to do a workaround. And this basically explains why. And one thing, so you might um, think that um, you, there are some people in the world who are against code comments. And to be honest, I'm one of them. Um, I don't comment my code. I believe that code should be self-documenting. I believe that with the code flow and with the um, variable names and function names, you should be able to get a really good idea of what the code does. And if you can't, you should refactor it. But I do this. I comment things that are unusual and that makes them stand out and that makes them more useful. So in summary, here are my two tips. You decide what good code means for your project. Document the Zen of your code base in your README and enforce it. And secondly, every code base has a story. It has a history, it's had a life. Explain the things that are not obvious to the future you or the future developer. <laughs>